Chapter 23, Escape. They let Rico and me go into the water. I drank my fill and then drank some more. Pretty soon his ankle will swell up, Jara was telling Morales as they watched from the shade of a nearby mystique. His whole leg is going to blow like a carcass. We'll have to leave him behind. I give you permission to carry his pack if that's what you're wondering about, Morales said with a laugh. Jara looked at me with hatred, flickered back his forelock and said, Why not put a bullet in him? Don't listen, Rico whispered. He's only messing with your mind. I crawled off to wait for the swelling and the whore to come. I'll stay behind with you, no matter what, Rico said. Don't. He'll put a bullet in you, too. After an hour, my heart was still racing, my head still pounding, but my ankle and leg were the same as ever. Calm down, Rico said. Maybe nothing's going to happen from the snake bite. He fell asleep. The sun was stuck in the sky. Time dragged. In Arizona, a day in May went on forever. Hours later, the sun was finally sinking. The bump on my head was swollen and I was suffering from the heat. But that was all. Moonrise wasn't far off. The mules were getting ready to saddle up again, and so was I. They were all talking about me and the rattlesnake, wondering how I could have been so lucky. Paco said there was such a thing as a bite with no poison. And that must be what happened. Jar gave me a look as if to say he would deal with me later. I could only think I had been given a miracle. I knew who to thank. The Virgin of Guadalupe, whose image I carried in my pocket and my mother. She had been lighting candles for me in the village church, same as she used to for my father. As soon as the moon rose over the mountains, huge and brilliant, we started out. We were going to walk all night again. There was talk about a well. Our direction remained the same, due north, up and down the flanks of the mountains. Late in the night, we came to the bottom of a canyon and the well. A rugged dirt road ended here. There were tire tracks in the road, which made the mules nervous. Morales looked down the road to stand guard as Jara lowered a bucket. I drank the last of my water. The bucket struck bottom with a hollow clang. Every mule let out a groan, me included. Jara went to find Morales. I looked around for Rico, but he wasn't there. A few minutes later, Rico was back. I asked him where he had been. Call of nature, he whispered. His eyebrows were all knitted together. Never a good sign. What's wrong? I whispered back. Tell you later. Morales and Jara returned. Settle up, Morales ordered. After that, I couldn't stop worrying. The way Rico was acting, I knew he must have overheard Jara and Morales, heard them talking about us. But what, what had he heard? What a relief when dawn finally came to drop my pack, flop aside it on the ground, and think about food instead. Each of us was issued two tins of fish and two tortillas. The sardines were salty and packed in mustard. It was difficult to get them past my swollen tongue, tongue without water. Settle up, Morales ordered all too soon. The sun shot up like a rocket and stuck there, scorching high in the sky. I hated the boss. I hated the boss as much as I hated Jara. The head of the centipede with his light pack didn't seem to notice that the rest of us had to run to keep up. Somebody was going to drop dead. The sun was practically overhead before Morales, with a grin, finally unslung his rifle. Fine shade, he said. We'll take a siesta. The shade was scarce and quickly taken. As usual, Rico and I were going to have to walk the farthest to find Denny. We exchanged glances as we stumbled along in the heat. We have to talk, Rico said. I haven't forgotten. We crawled under the branches of a mystique. We have to get away, Rico said. They're going to kill us. Did you hear them say that? It's what somebody else heard. Cornelio from Nogales, the one who fell and you helped him up. He heard Jara telling Morales that they couldn't let us go, that they couldn't let us go when this was over, that we would talk, that we would identify them. Did Cornelio say that Morales, did Cornelio say what Morales said back to Jara? that Jara could take care of it. Jara said he'd be happy to. Mother of God, maybe we should go now, Rico. I think everyone, everybody will sleep a while. 
Morales and Jar included. What about water? Take our chances on finding some? Maybe so. Right here, right now, we have a chance at a head, at a head start. Do we, we have to hope the siesta is a long one. Do we go down into the valley or up into the mountains? Down below, it's crawling with border patrol. I was afraid you were going to say that, but these mountains are dry as a bone. Miguel said that mountains have water. It just a ma it's just a matter of finding it. Ah, the wise Miguel. Rico, shall I strangle you now or later? Later, he said. I think you're right about going where the border patrol aren't. These mountains are skinny. We can cross them quickly. Straight across to the other side. We'll hit that paved road from Sabase up to Tuscan. We'll get lucky and get a ride. We have to hope so. We got ready. We were going to go light. My pocket knife, a tin of fish in each of our pack, back pockets, our empty water jugs. Rico took a walk back through the mules to see if any were on their feet. It's now or never, he said when he got back. We propped our packs out. We propped our packs out in the open to make it seem we were close by, then sneaked away. The first patch of solid rock we came to, we started climbing. They aren't going to follow, I said. Not in this heat. Jar would be crazy enough, Rico said, and I knew he was right. We kept climbing. Sometimes it was hand over hand. The slope was taking the burnt, the brunt of the midday sun, and we were drenched with sweat. We climbed out of the foothills and onto the slopes of the higher mountains, above where the giant cactus could grow. It's much cooler up here, I gasped. Your brain is boiling, Mono. So is the water in my jug. I'm going to burn a hole. It's going to burn a hole in the plastic. In case you haven't noticed, your jug is empty. I'm afraid I will scale, I will scald my tongue. I took off the cap and pretended to drink. Now we're both out of water. At least no one is following us at, as we are dying of thirst. Thank God for that. We couldn't keep climbing straight up. The slope was getting even steeper. It was overgrown with cactus and yucca. We angled to the north, climbing more gradually. Eventually, eventually we came within sight of a huge canyon down below. We had to find water. The heat had us feverish, dizzy, dizzy, stumbling, skinning up our knees and hands. We followed an animal trail along the, along, around the slope as we approached the canyon. Vultures and caracas were circling overhead. Did we look that bad off? By Rico's watch, it was four o'clock, four hours since our escape, and still broiling. We angled into the canyon in the direction of some mine tailings and tumbled down shack close to the bottom. The slope was steep, strewn with, gra with gravel loose as marbles. It was going to take a long time to get down, but we didn't have an any choice. There had to be water down there. Without water, a prospector wouldn't have lasted long enough to build a shack. Without water, we weren't going to make it over the mountains. At the shack, we found nothing but bottles turned purple by the sun, bits of ancient trash, decades of rat droppings, a rusty well casting stick out of the ground raised our hopes. The pipe was six inches across, wide enough to let us lower one of the bottles inside. If only we could see some quarter wire, but would there be water? I dropped a small stone down the pipe to find out. It hit with a solid clunk. Rico made a bitter face and swallowed hard. Maybe farther up the canyon, I said. The floor of the canyon was smooth as concrete. We rounded a bend and there was suddenly, and there suddenly was our water glistening where it dropped out of a stream above the bedrock. Rico's eyes went to something else and then I saw it too. To the side, and in the full glare of the sun, lay the body of a man in uniform. A uniform with a dark green shirt. Border Patrol, Rico whispered. We walked up close. The man was on his back, eyes closed. Flies were buzzing around his round, full face. His chest is all swollen up, I said. That's his body armor underneath. 
Rico fell for a pulse at his neck. He's alive. He got him, I guess. You think he was after us? Who knows? I'm just wondering if there's more of them. Doesn't seem like it, I said, looking over my shoulder. No shade to drag him, to drag him into. Maybe water will bring him around? What about his gun, that radio, that club, and that can of spray? Hide them? Drop him down the pipe we found, where he can't possibly get them? It's only a couple of minutes back. You sure about the radio? Wouldn't he need to call for help? Are you kidding? Let him call for help? That would be the end of the story for us. If we get him cooled down and he comes to, he's on his own, just like we are. Are we going to talk all day? We took the patrolman's things and hurried away to get rid of them while Rico went to fill our jugs. At the well, at the well casing, I dropped the gun, the spray, and the club. The radio in my hand was all that was left. I hesitated. What if water didn't help and the man still needed to needed to get out. Were we going to let him die? I hurried back and hid the small radio just before I got to Rico. The patrolman was up on one elbow, looking around, blinking. His eyes on Rico poured water down his broad forehead. His name plate said Torres. Who are you? was the first thing he said. We got abandoned by our Polero, Rico said. We're trying to climb out. Suddenly, the policeman realized that his gun was missing, his radio and all the rest. What have you done? Nothing, Rico said. Don't lie to me. Where are my things? Down a pipe, I said. Way, way down. Wh why? Why would you do that? His voice was desperate, strangled. Rico sort of laughed. I suppose you were going to let us go? Under the circumstances, yes. What circumstances? Look at the back of my head, but don't touch. We looked. A sharp piece of rock was sticking out of his skull. The hair around it was all matted with blood. Some blood had run down his neck and between his shoulders. Hey, I, I said, looking at the sharp, the thin, sharp rock. What's that doing there? I was in a gunfight. There were rocks and boulders all around, around us. They sprayed lots of fire off the rocks. The splinter got me in the back of my head. Where was this gun battle? Rico demanded. At the mouth of the canyon. You want us to pull the rock out? I asked. Don't touch it. You can kill me if you try to pull it out. Should we wrap something around it then? So it wouldn't fall so it won't fall out? It might that might push it deeper. Just leave it just leave it alone. Torres checked his watch. I wasn't unconscious long. My partner and I were attacked by drug smugglers. Rico gave me a nudge. Let's get out of here before his partner comes. He's dead, the patrolman said with a grimace. We were outgunned. They had an assault rifle. Rico and I exchanged glances. Was it Morales and his mules that Torres had run into at the mouth of this canyon after their siesta? Was that possible? How come you didn't radio for help when you were attacked, Rico said, or Rico asked. No reception. I was trying to climb out of here when I blacked out. There's a trail close by. Higher up, I could get reception. Tell me, please, where you put the radio. We already told you, Rico said. It's way down at the bottom of the pipe. God help me, Torres said. They've cut me off from my vehicle, and they're tracking me now. I looked down the canyon in a panic. In a panic, I, would, I looked down the canyon. In a panic, I would see Jara, Morales, or both. How do you know that? Soon as the gunfire let me let up, I scrambled around to where I could see. It was drug runners, all right. I, put, I saw them put their bales on their backs and take off. Two stay behind. They know I would have a radio on me. They're guessing, they're guessing I haven't gotten through yet on account of the train. One of those two had, has the assault rifle. I saw them starting after me. If they were following you, Rico scoffed, they would have been here by now. They're afraid of ambush, moving slow. I beg you, please. They might be here any minute. I've got the radio, I admitted.